My name is Robin Atfield and I am an Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Cardiff University. Thank you for inviting me and congratulations to the Humanist International on the Reykjavik Declaration on the Climate Change Crisis with its endorsement of quote the need for a global transition to new ways of using resources and new means of generating energy that will be socially and environmentally sustainable and with its call on governments and regional authorities for quote urgent action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make land use and resource extraction sustainable and to protect and conserve wild habitats together with with its support for quote urgent and long-term policy making to mitigate and prevent climate change that's the Reykjavik Declaration of 2019. My title today is Ethical Dilemmas Arising from Climate Change. The contemporary world and everyone alive in it today are faced with a climate emergency, with aerial pollution and maritime pollution often threatening human health, and severe losses to wildlife and biodiversity, and with climate change generating flooding of coasts, islands and river valleys, and also unprecedented storms, droughts and wildfires of increasing frequency and intensity. The ethical reasons for taking action include human well-being, present and future, and also the well-being of members of other species, including those threatened with extinction and the preservation of their habitats and ecosystems. But even if this match is agreed, many choices remain to be made about policies and priorities and bring dilemmas with them. Now to some climate related dilemmas. The scale and urgency of the problems involve us in difficult choices and dilemmas. First, in terms of targets, the stronger target of the Paris Agreement of 2015 of limiting increases of average temperature to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels means that the all-time budget for carbon emissions reduces from 1 trillion tonnes, the limit for a ceiling of 2 degrees, to 3 quarters of a trillion or 750 billion tonnes. I base these figures incidentally on a paper of Meinhausen and others in the journal Nature of 2009. Since we, that is humanity, have emitted well over half of these amounts already, we need plans to become carbon neutral as soon as possible and measures to be adopted without delay to make such plans feasible. The official British government plan to phase out the sale of petrol cars and hybrid cars by 2035 is promising, but may be too late. And the amended suggestion from a minister to do this by 2032 is more promising. But these plans presuppose the prior installation of a comprehensive national system of electric charging points and an energy system sourced from renewable and nuclear sources. Much more concerted and government-based action is needed if these presuppositions are to be made into realities. One further dilemma concerns whether nuclear sources of energy should be included. Here my view is that since the waste products cannot be safely stored, and plants cannot be safely decommissioned, they should not be included. But some people claim that the alternatives are at least as bad. What all this contributes to is the date by which the United Kingdom should become carbon neutral. The government plan is to do this by 2050. But that date is later than the date given by Meinhausen by which humanity will have used up its carbon budget for attaining even the two degree limit, which is 2044. Thus, the option of 2050 is likely to set the wrong example for the Glasgow Conference of the Parties 
now delayed to November 2021, where national commitments need to be ratcheted up and where the hosts need to set an example. So a much earlier date should be possible, should a, a much earlier date should if possible be set, a date by which oil and gas boilers will have been replaced by electric ones, as well as cars becoming electric fueled and if possible aeroplanes as well. We should now turn to the efforts of other countries to mitigate their emissions and to adapt to the increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that are by now unavoidable. Many third world countries are not going to achieve what is needed without technological and financial assistance. Technological, um, so, so it should, I suggest, be national policy to assist these transitions both financially and with technology transfer. There are precedents for this. When it was discovered in the 1980s that ozone depleting chemicals were exposing millions of people to skin cancer through solar radiation, both China and India were induced to set aside plans to manufacture CFCs, that is chlorofluorocarbons, and HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, the main ozone depleting chemicals, through technology transfer and financial support from Western countries. Ozone levels are now set to recover over a 60 year period and so this operation was overall a success. This is just the kind of project that is now needed to assist third world countries with carbon mitigation and adaptation. Other options are for the UK to focus on its own problems and leave all this to others, or to focus on former colonies and not on the remaining countries. But the risk, if so, is that the world will outstrip its carbon budget and everyone and all creatures will suffer increasingly in consequence. It should be added that at least in some cases these countries are owed compensation for being subjected to climate change despite having contributed very little to its generation. This is an ethical reason, additional to self-interest and benevolence, for taking up this challenge. Besides the dilemma about whether to make available such assistance, there are also dilemmas about the form that it should take. Many third world countries need further economic development in order to satisfy the needs of their resident populations. But much development assistance is of contestable quality with, for example, large dams being introduced which tend to silt up within three decades and similar misguided schemes. In the matter of climate mitigation and adaptation, assistance with renewable energy generation is likely to be one important kind of contribution, whether in the form of hydroelectric schemes, wind power, tidal energy or solar energy. But even this kind of assistance needs to form part of an integrated development plan, including provision of schools and hospitals, with a strong emphasis on boosting female education, one of the key factors of development and also contributory to the reduction of family size and to the stabilising of population. For it is important to remember that climate change is not the only problem and that policies to respond to it need to be integrated with those required to solve other ongoing problems such as poverty, malnutrition and population increase. There is also a need for collaboration between donor countries in consultation with recipient countries to ensure that no countries are left without assistance and without appropriate assistance. That would both be unjust and discriminatory 
and disadvantageous to everyone in view of the runaway emissions likely to ensue. To recap, the dilemmas that I have been discussing concern the date by which the UK should become carbon neutral and the policy commitments that should be offered to facilitate the ratcheting up of national commitments at the Conference of the Parties to be held in Glasgow in November 2021. There is a related dilemma about whether nuclear energy should be included in the mix of energy, energy sources alongside renewables. There is also the possible decision to assist third world countries towards climate change mitigation and adaptation with financial and technology transfers. Then there are policy decisions about the form that such assistance should take and about collaboration between donor and recipient countries. These dilemmas I perforce hand over to you because I'm afraid my time is up.